to today's topic, international affairs, reasons to be optimistic. Well, when was the last time you read a happy international <laughs> affairs headline? And isn't it strange during the middle of a global pandemic to be finding ways to be optimistic about the world? Well, actually, optimism is an outlook worth cultivating. And to tell us why, we're joined by Melissa Conley Tyler. Melissa is currently the Director of Diplomacy at AsiaLink at the University of Melbourne. Before that, for the last 13 years, she was National Executive Director of AWIA, Australian Institute of International Affairs. She's the author of Think Tank Diplomacy. And at the end of last year, she was made a Fellow of the Institute in recognition of distinguished contribution to international relations. Melissa, we're delighted to have you as Fellow of the Institute. Normally, we would be doing a formal presentation of an award to you in person, a large glass statue like this. Obviously, we can't at the moment. We'll rectify that whenever we can. But thank you very much for joining us and on our hand across to you. Thank you very much, Alistair. And I acknowledge the Indigenous custodians of the lands on which we are each meeting here today. Um, it is an enormous honour to receive, uh, receive a fellowship of the AIA. Um, and uh, that's very kind of you to, to, to show me one. Um, I, I, had, uh, I had imagined what this might be like and that, you know, our National Vice President, Sarah Kimpton, might be handing it to me, one of the best read people in international affairs I know, or it might be AA Victoria President Patrick Moore. Um, and I was also on the watch for the things that can go wrong. If you have a look at these pretty little items, which I'll just show you now so we can all see them. You can see that globe on the top. Yeah, things can go wrong with that, which we've had before if the glue isn't on properly. We've had a very bad time when it was um, put in checked luggage. So it may be that we're really doing the safest way that we can. I think for me, one of the things that's most exciting about this is just feeling like I'm going to be permanently part of the AWA family. Um, the Australian Institute of International Affairs is a national institution. It's now coming up for its 100th anniversary in 2024. Uh, and the work it does in promoting public understanding and interest in international affairs is just so important. And so to be here tonight, to be celebrating with my friends from across the country, I know we have members from WA, Queensland, from TAS and New South Wales and ACT, as well as Vic joining us tonight, it means so much to me. So I thought I'd celebrate by spending, I don't know, a couple of hours giving you an erudite talk with, with many references. Perhaps not. Um, what I'd like to do instead is have a little bit of fun and I hope maybe uh, cheer us all up a little bit at this time. So um, my topic is international affairs reasons to be optimistic. And I know you think that's a strange timing in the midst of a global pandemic to look at why we should be optimistic about the world. So my son, for example, uh, is probably not on the line because he thought, dear, oh dear, you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, but mum's going to talk about smiley face reasons to be optimistic. So I'm taking a calculated risk that you'll be sick of doom and gloom and want some stories of hope. And just up on screen in a sec, you'll see a poll giving a bit of a temperature check of how optimistic we're feeling in this room. So optimism is a serious topic. Um, and I want to give a shout out to the work of Victor Purton, AWA Vic member, and his Centre for Optimism, who put together a lot of material that make the compelling case for why we should be trying to be optimistic. So it has benefits for us individually, um, in terms of our health, longevity, life satisfaction, but it also has benefits for us as a society. Um, it gives us an orientation towards problem solving. So pessimists in general, you know, and if you look at work of someone like Martin Seligman, um, uh, who's um, you know, very well known internationally for his work on positive psychology, you know, pessimists tend to believe bad events are going to last a long time, will undermine everything they've done and are probably their own fault. Okay? And optimists try to have a different approach, which is seeing them as temporary, challenged to try harder, and trying to find ways to solve problems including, for example, seeking support, emotional support when needed, um, and being accepting that there are sometimes situations that we just can't solve. 
So if you're looking for innovation and entrepreneurship and the creativity that we want, then that really comes from experimentation, from, uh, from you know, resilience. And that's what you get from an optimistic uh, orientation. I think the worst thing is really how paralyzing fear is for us. So if you think about it, and John Hagel spoke about this very well at the Centre for Optimism recently, you know, if we're weighed down by fear, it's very hard to try to solve the problems that we have. And if the stats are that 40% of us report being weighed down with fear at the moment, that's a real problem. Now, the good news, of course, is optimism can be learned. There are things that we can do, um, even in the worst situations, to try to find an orientation that helps us get through that situation. Um, and I think it's going to help people respond on big and difficult international issues if we can, if we can uh, help them see the possibilities. So if you think of, you know, what does fear do for you? Well, I'd say mostly it's not motivating. So when wonderful group of people at the Centre for the Human Future put together a list of the 10 risks of the end of civilization and human extinction, I don't find, think most of us find it motivating, even though it's a very accurate and well and good list. And, and I'm really concerned in particular for the future for young people. Um, young people ideally should be looking forward, um, not necessarily with hope, but at least with the sense that there are problems that can be solved and, and overcome. We need to imagine what can be if we're going to try and get there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at some of our fears and show why, yeah, perhaps it's not that bad. And in particular, I want to look at what we're doing at an international level to avoid worst case scenarios. And I'm going to do it just, as I say, in the spirit of fun, by looking at disaster fiction. So I'm going to look at apocalyptic movies and books that show us what are the worst possibilities. And then I'm going to tell, us a little, tell you a little bit about what we're trying to do internationally to avert those worst case scenarios. And just so you know, I'm not making it too easy for myself. I'm not going to go with the easy ones. Okay. So my view is that probably you're not going to be eaten by a zombie. There it is. I think you probably won't end up driving around in deserts where everything except petroleum has strangely disappeared. I don't think it's going to be something astronomical, you know, exploding sun, exploding earth, solar flare. Though, honestly, if I got to choose one, I'd vote for wandering earth. The idea of pushing the whole earth out of the solar system by putting rockets on one side, that's, that's gold. And I'm not going to talk in about anything about aliens. Full stop. Just not. Okay. What I'm going to do instead is look at four big fears, which I think define our time and give the case for optimism. So I'm going to be looking at pandemics, climate change, nuclear and technology. I would say that in many ways, we're, our time on Earth is defined by the fears. So if you look back to, I don't know, the 1920s, you know, it's, it's all about um, inequality. It's about, you know, the proletarian revolution, even if you're dealing with the Queen of Mars. Um, in the 70s, when I was growing up, so much of the focus was on overpopulation, um, up to the grisly point of Soylent Green. Um, we worry about totalitarianism. Um, when new things come, like, like genetics, uh, you know, um, sequencing, we worry about that. And worrying about gender politics is something we probably should always worry about. But I'm going to focus, as I say, on pandemics, climate nuclear and technology. So good time if you'd like to use the question function. Do you agree with me on these fears? So let me start with pandemics. This is the one on everyone's mind, yes? So imagine we're all wiped out by a plague. Hmm. It's been around for a while. So it's at least as old as H.G. Wells, um, the very first international fantasy award winner, um, Earth Abides, had 99% of the Earth's population. Um, and, you know, these days, uh, the book that my son studied in year 12 last year, Station 11, you know, again, we're all wiped out. Um, hint of Netflix, though, I'd have to say, I think the odds of there being precisely one human surviving is probably pretty low. Now, 
I'm going to focus on the movie Contagion, which I suspect a few people have watched lately, just a guess. Um, I think it's pretty realistic in some ways, and it gives a very helpful point of view. Now, that said, I'm going to say I don't think it'll quite turn out like that, and my answer is why. Well, in that movie, for example, the virus killed a lot more people than is likely. Um, the long battle between humans and viruses is a constant one where if they are too deadly, they will not spread enough. Um, and what we're seeing at the moment with COVID-19 is probably somewhere in that sweet, sweet spot where it's not deadly enough, like say Ebola, where it remains um, uh, you know, confined to one area. Um, uh, but it's not so, what do you say, not deadly, not so more or less benign, that we can just live with it like a common cold. So it's in that space at the moment. Now, in terms of, you know, what we do internationally to deal with this, this certainly is something we have systems for and is not unprecedented. So you have at the you know, peak of the system, as it were, the World Health Organization. Um, so this is uh, an intergovernmental organization uh, made up of member states um, in the World Health Assembly and directed by those states. Um, its job is to, um, well, it, it puts a few and not many um, requirements on states. Uh, states have agreed through the World Health Assembly to international health regulations, which means that countries have to build their own public health capacity and they must notify the World Health Organization um, of outbreaks within their territory that may constitute a public health emergency of international concern. So what you can hear from that is that there aren't enforcement measures. Um, you know, the World Health Organization can only enter a country in it if invited. And that's because states don't want it to do more. Um, that said, you know, even the point now, which we haven't had in human history before, where states really are under pressure to at least share information, that is very important. And what that does in terms of early warning for countries really matters. Um, World Health Organization is also very important in terms of its contingency fund for emergencies. So for countries with least developed countries with weaker health systems, it is able to send out its global health emergency workforce and do work to assist. Um, you'll see that in other areas as well. So for example, um, you know, the, the World Bank has, um, has a, a contingency fund um, pandemic emergency facility, which assists. Um, in global health, one of the interesting things is it's not just government. So if you look at things like uh, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, Global Fund for Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria, um, and more recently something like the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness uh, Innovations, there's a lot of people, and I've got there as well the National Academy of Medicine and obviously the scientific community, there's a lot of people who are working very hard to deal with these situations. Um, and Australia, interestingly, has been quite involved in trying to improve this system. So, so Kevin Rudd reminds us today again that he was on, he chaired the Independent Commission on Multilateralism report, which looked at how can countries work together post um, Ebola on global pandemics. And he suggested things like improving and reforming the WHO, increasing funding to WHO for health crises, and building more norms, you know, building norms of international law, which mean that states cooperate more rather than just keeping their sovereignty. So any questions, if you want more on pandemics, please use the question function and you can vote other people's questions out. So my next one, climate. So of course, this has been uh, explored by many, many movies. Um, we have, ones where we exhaust the Earth's resources, um, we have ecological capacity, uh, collapse, and then, of course, we head off to state, space. So you can see that in things like Silent Running, Wally, -E, Interstellar, or Io. Um, others focus a lot on the natural disasters, which are going to be much more um, common uh, brought by climate change. So you think, see things like geostorm, day after tomorrow, and then you've got something like Snowpiercer, which is, look, its own kind of weird. Um, it's like Mad Max in the snow. Nothing more to be said. But look, the one I'm going to focus on, I think is one of the most memorable, which is Waterworld. 
So in Waterworld, you have a situation where uh, the, the crust of the earth has all been covered over with water, apart from, it is rumoured, uh, the tops of the Himalayas, which are the last dry land anywhere. Okay. Um, why won't it turn out like that? Not exactly like that. Okay. It won't turn out exactly like that because we are warned and we are trying to have some international cooperation. Okay. So in terms of the we are warned, we have the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, whose job it is to put together the best information on um, and the knowledge base that we need to understand the risks. We then have the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which has universal membership, where we have agreed joint action and we have agreed on some compliance mechanisms. And then you've got lots of agencies like the UN Environment Programme, the UN Development Programme, even Food and Agriculture Organisation, which works on deforestation, that are trying to work there. Now, I would love to put on this screen all of the industry and civil society and scientists who are working, but I just couldn't. There's, there's so much and the huge level of commitment and action that is there. The hope is that that breaks through the sort of difficult problem that climate change is. So climate change is, in policy terms, a wicked problem for a range of reasons. First, it's long term. And humans aren't particularly good at that. We're better at dealing with things that happen right now. We tend to discount what's happening in the future. And we can show that behaviourally. Secondly, it requires individual change. Now, that's tricky. Um, much, much easier to put some people in some suits and shoot them off to, you know, battle an asteroid um, where we don't all have to change our behaviour. At domestic politics level, it's got winners and losers. And as always, the losers are going to be louder in trying to make sure that they don't have the what they see as the, the, the downside of the regulation. And internationally, we have the problem that um, every state would prefer to do as little as possible and for everyone else to shoulder the burden. Um, so you put all of that together, it's amazing that we're doing anything. Clearly, we're not working as quickly as the urgency of the issues require. Um, a lot of climate change effects are already locked in um, on the basis of the emissions we, we have sent into the atmosphere. But the fact we have international cooperation is, I think, notable. Now, what I hope happens at some point is that this flips, that instead of seeing the fear side of climate, we see the opportunity. And while humans are bad to respond on some sort of problems, they're really good at innovating when they see an opportunity. So once you get to the point where companies and even countries see the competitive advantage of switching to low carbon future, you, you have a, a shifting point. And so the way I keep optimism in the face of, I think, you know, really much slower action than I would like is seeing what is being built and thinking how quickly humans can flip when we decide that it's overwhelming. Again, I'm looking forward to your feedback and views in the question function. So what am I on next? So nuclear. Now, this I, I don't know if everyone on the call um, is, is seeing this as much as me, but I, I think this is one that's been a staple for a long time and is continuing. So you can see, um, you know, it was a it was a key thing during during the Cold War, obviously. So I've got on the beach, Doctor Strange Love, and the wind blows, and you know, it still has currency today. I think of there's a certain sort of Hollywood blockbuster where you know. North Koreans, Iranians, somebody break into the White House and try and use the nuclear button. Yeah, that sort of thing. Um, please, in the questions, don't ask me to distinguish between the movies. I would not manage it. Um, and, you know, even today, my, my daughter plays Fallout. Um, it's a very popular game that still looks as if, uh, you know, nuclear issues are on people's minds. So the movie I'm going to focus on, and I think I'm showing my age here, is a movie called War Games. Okay. And I find it interesting because it shows to me that, in fact, the biggest danger that we have today on nuclear is not human decision, um, it's accidents or mistakes. 
um, in that movie, uh, an artificial intelligence um, gets hold of a uh, nuclear arsenal and is about to start a, essentially a preemptive strike and then works out through playing tic-tac-toe forever uh, that you can't win. If people are making rational decisions, that's what they should decide. Nuclear weapons are useful to, for example, um, deter others uh, for your uh, um, importance and status in the international system. Look at North Korea, which uses nukes to take it from being a very unimportant country to one that people take somewhat seriously. Um, you, th there's a number of reasons why you might want nuclear weapons, but really all of them involve not using them because using them means you've, you know, you've essentially failed in your objectives. The biggest threat that therefore we face is, is accident. Um, and we've been astonishingly fortunate so far that so many of the near misses that happened, um, the automated, you must drop a bomb was questioned by the um, operator who said, oh, look, I actually want confirmation that I really should do this before I do so. It would be very, very easy for, for that to be an issue. And um, from my side, you know, that means reducing nuclear arsenals actually reduces risks quite significantly um, and has essentially the same deterrent effect. So in terms of what are we doing, you know, why, why will we hopefully not get to that point? Well, there's a lot happening internationally. So the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, which won the Nobel Prize, has, a, has real teeth and you know, can in fact um, bring a lot uh, to bear on particular countries. Um, we, now, we have the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs over, oversees the review conference for that. Um, and we have a lot coming from civil society. So um, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons established here in Australia and again winning a Nobel Prize um, has pushed so hard uh, towards an abolitionist agenda. So we now have the, um, the, the nuclear ban treaty, as it's, as it's colloquially known, which has a huge number of countries that are signed up, uh, not nuclear powers and not powers that rely on others' nuclear umbrellas, but a lot of other countries. And again, that pushes for a sense of taboo, that these are not just like other weapons, these are weapons whose use and acquisition should be very, very carefully policed by the international community. And the fact that that's held up so long since the last use of nuclear weapons, I think is really quite notable. So again, any questions on that? So the last one I'm gonna focus on is technology. And again, I'd say this is pretty much a staple. We've always been worried about cyborgs, absolutely. So I've got Robocop, Terminator, Chappie, Ghost in the Shell, a range of these. Um, these days, I think the focus that, that, that's there in most of the discussion is on artificial intelligence. Um, so, you know, when we make artificial intelligence that is smarter than us, what will happen? Will it turn on us? Will that be the singularity that ends our species? And the one I'm going to focus on is the matrix. Uh, again, you can see my my habits. So in this case, our, our creatures have realised that we are a wonderful source of electrical um, uh, current. So we've put in little pods and we're harvested for the electricity coming from our brain. Now, why won't it turn out like that? Now, partly because I don't think there's enough electricity in our brain. Maybe that's just me. But one of the reasons it won't talk, turn out like that is because we will have international discussions on it. It's at a very early stage, and I've got to say, this is, this is one of the areas that's very much emerging. It's starting to be seen as a worry and therefore starting to be the subject for more international discussion and cooperation. So within the UN, there's the UN Review Conference on the Convention, Convention on Conventional Weapons, and it has um, a focus on what I think they call certain other weapons, is the, is the particular term for this. Um, Interestingly, uh, a lot of the work again has happened uh, by scientists, by um, you know, university professors, by think tankers who are really showing the potential concerns about technology, about what happens if we have lethal autonomous weapons who think for themselves or don't think for themselves and just follow orders, but we've taken the human out of the equation. 
So um, the Future of Life Institute um, is something that I've heard a lot about from uh, Professor Toby Walsh from the University of New South Wales, who came and spoke at the AAA National Conference um, a couple of years ago. Um, they've been petitioning the UN, they have 28 countries on board, not the manufacturers, not the US, UK, Russia, Israel, or South Korea, but others do. And the, um, at the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence, um, I, I chose the Australian one, but I think it was the year after, there's been a lot happening on how we can make uh, AI an area that we actually do um, regulate um, rather than allowing it to overtake us. So they're the ones I focused on. What you might hear from this is that I think optimism is a choice. Um, and as a AA fellow, Gareth Evans noted in his book, Incorrigible uh, Optimist, um, we get to decide how we're going to approach things. So if there's a cataclysm, I personally choose to think that we are going to have that deep human desire to rebuild society that you saw in something like The Postman, rather than all turning cannibal like in the road. So I may be wrong, I may be right, but choosing optimism is helpful for me. Um, one of the, the very scariest of the um, catastrophe stories I've seen is one called Children of Men, Alfonso Cuarón. In this one, there's no more children. Um, therefore, there's no more hope. And I think if we really were the last generation, there would be no cause for optimism. What I always remind myself is that there are people who will follow us. And our job is to try to make the world a little bit better for them. So giving up, even when one feels it is all overwhelming, it's not just self-defeating for me, it's also selfish. It's not thinking about the future. So I think of it almost as my obligation to try to keep as much optimism as I can. Now, it's a slightly different genre of movie, but one of my favorite time travel movies is something called About Time. It's very much a cheap flick, but I hope some people have seen it. So the protagonist finds that he can go back in time to a particular day and live it again. And so he can therefore change the future by living that day differently. And his first response is, well, I'll go back and I'll make everything perfect. If I only live this day just right, it will all be perfect. And it never works because whenever he changes something, he creates other problems. There is no such thing essentially as perfection. So eventually he finds the trick. And the trick is live each day twice. Live it one day like normal with all the normal stresses and strains that you have. And live, live it a second day trying to take joy in what's irreplaceable and beautiful about that day. Live each day like we're actually lucky to be here. So for me, diplomacy, international institutions, civil society, government, these are all heroes. They're trying to build a better world. They're choosing optimism rather than the pessimism that could engulf us. And for me, that's a reason to be optimistic. Thank you. Melissa, thank you very much. We're grinning away and optimistic here. There are lots of questions coming in. Um, I'm gonna just take, and once, if you can stop your screen share, and then that's perfect. So we might just jump to some of the the most popular ones. So at the moment, um, well, okay, one of the most popular, as disasters become more common and the impact on more people occurs, like urbanization and population growth, uh, how can we ensure our political class are better prepared for emergencies, both with resources and being, being transparent? So I guess, are you optimistic there may be more transparency? Look, it depends a bit where you live. Honestly, um, it depends on your system of government and whether transparency is seen as a political good or not. Um, but can I say, I really like that focus of the question of accepting that, yep, disasters are going to become more common. They are going to impact on more people. And then our job is going to be to make our political classes respond in the way that they need to. For example, to make sure that, as we know, um, since, as we know, the, the, the negatives will fall disproportionately on the less advantaged people in society, that our government is actually responding to that. 
that we're not leaving people out and that we're actively trying to make a better society when we are responding to these. So I think that's our advocacy task, to tell that to governments. Uh, what can be done to counter a growing scepticism of globalization, but of global NGOs? Is, is, there a, is, the, is the focus on anti-globalization also having a negative impact on NGOs and what they're trying to do? Hmm. It's interesting. I, I haven't seen any data on this to, to know exactly how it's playing out. Um, my feeling is most of it has been going towards international, you know, intergovernmental organisations, international organisations rather than to NGOs. I think um, general publics tend to see NGOs as being sort of citizen-led, whether that's true or not is a different thing, but they tend to see it in that way, that this is groups of concerned individuals doing things. And so I think that they're somewhat um, insulated against some of that sort of anti-globalisation. But I'd be really interested to see if this figure's showing differently. Um, I mean, international organisations, I think, get a really raw deal on this because what they are is groups of members, yes? So the United Nations can do precisely what its member states let it. The World Health Organization can do precisely what its member states let it do. Um, but if there's a crisis, very often um, member states don't want to say, oh yeah, well, I suppose we should have shared more data or we should have given up more sovereignty. No, they say it's the international organization's fault. And um, yeah, that's, that, that's been, happening for a very long time and I don't expect it to change, but I think it's unfortunate. I think it's important that we remember the difference between those things. Looking, looking at, I mean, you talked about uh, opportunities that arise from, from new technologies or um, emerging ideas. Um, there's a question, could you envisage a new international organization that would focus on, on creating and enforcing norms uh, with respect to emerging technology. This is something like the IAEA, but maybe going mm. beyond that. Yeah, and I think that's exactly what people like Toby Walsh and the Future of Life Institute are looking at. They're saying we need that same sort of international collaboration and international effort to make sure that individual states don't do things that are going to harm all of us. And, and that, in the end, of course, is why we do things internationally together. That's where international collaboration comes from, from understanding that um, each country individually can't deal with this issue. You know, Australia can't make its policy on pandemics or climate or technology or nuclear and make itself safe. The only way it can make itself safe is through international co cooperation, through working with other people. And, and I think that's, in a way, I'm answering the question of how do we make the case for increased multilateralism? You know, that, that is the argument, that nationalism in the end doesn't keep you safe. Now, that's going to be a tricky one because I suspect a lot of people right now are feeling like nationalism is what keeps them safe. It's like we put it, we closed our borders and then we were safe, you know. And, um, we have to keep making the argument that that actually isn't enough. Like, for example, if we want to be safe long term from pandemics, we have to care about the public health systems of many countries. For example, we have to keep up our development aid to the Pacific because eventually, if if their health systems collapse, if they're not able to deal with these health, public health emergencies, eventually it will hit us. That's just inevitable. So we have an interest in other countries. It matters to us. It matters to us in our own self-interest to keep Australians safe and prosperous, what happens in other countries. And that's the case of internationalism. One, one of the factors that occurs to me, and I think it, it's picking up from a couple of questions, in, in times of, of global crisis, that the the issue of great power rivalry seems to come more to the fore and you get a lot of uh, head butting between leaders. If you look you know, at, at our level, at, at, at what think tanks can do or, or track to diplomacy, um, how, how do you see that being able to put a, 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 a you know, more human face on some of these issues and, and are you optimistic there's a way through? Oh, look, track two diplomacy can definitely help. Um, but, but that's it. I, I don't think you give up here on internationalism in times of great power rivalry. So, you know, we were able to eradicate smallpox during the Cold War. You know, you don't have to like other countries or get on well with them to be able to work internationally when there's a common threat. And so even though, you know, gro the growing US 
uh, China tensions, you know, the whole of society competition is the way that the US now talks about it. That makes things more difficult, absolutely, but it doesn't make it impossible. And it means we need the internationalism more and more. We've had a couple of questions. There's one, I, I love this. So, um, complimenting to yourself, but um, how, how do you get more people like you into international affairs? Does, does DFAT test recruits for optimism? I see how, that from how Victor. Do harness, how do you harness the optimism of youth to sort out some of these issues? Yeah, and I agree with that. And I think having young people involved is, is absolutely vital. Um, I, I don't think we do test people well for optimism. Um, I would say mostly governments um, select and train people to be very risk averse. Um, and I get why, you know, when you're dealing with difficult, important things, you want people who, who don't rush off and do you know, stupid stuff. Got that. <laughs> That's important. Um, but it, it can flip a little bit too much into uh, not seeing the possibilities. Um, and I think that's something all sectors, you know, have to think about. How do we get people who are thinking about the possibilities and, you know, inspiring others um, with strong narratives that take us in optimistic directions rather than essentially being fatalistic? Um, and I think, I think that's a real danger for a country like Australia, that a lot of these problems look so big and so difficult, and what can a country like Australia do? Well, we'll just, I don't know, see what happens. Um, and we, we want and should be more active than that, which I think we are. Um, but I, I do want to respond to the idea of, you know, people like me. I, for me, optimism is a sort of hard-won choice, as it were. Um, I find myself you know, essentially on a daily basis, wondering why one bothers, you know. And for me, that's about disrupting those thoughts. When I feel myself um, thinking, you know, is there any point? I have to say, well, yes, there is, you know. Um, and my, my little thing, my little good, whatever my little good is in my little part of the universe is still worth doing, even if the problems are big and overwhelming. Um, so I think of it as hard fought. It didn't, it doesn't come easy. It's something I have to constantly, constantly remind myself to do. Um, and, and I think, you know, again, I, I want to share that with others, that, you know, you, you're definitely not born optimistic. It's something, it's, a, it's an approach that you have to cultivate and you have to work on um, and hold yourself accountable for. There's a, following a little bit from that, there's a really good question here that um, one of the, the key investments made by government into soft power is through mobility programs like the new Colombo plan. And how do you think student mobility programs will change after, after COVID with, with travel bans? And you know, do, you see, do you see technology coming to the fore to, to do you know, virtual mobility? But um, how, how will multilateral people to people relations change? That's a really great question. And thank you, Cameron, for that one. As someone who has done so much to work on Australia Asia youth engagement, um, thanks for being here. Um, yeah, look, it's one of the areas I'm really worried about because if I'm looking at what new normal looks like uh, post-COVID, I think there is going to be a sense that the world outside our bubble is dangerous. You know, if, if we are successful and it looks like we're on the track for it to get sort of somewhere in a suppression um, eradication level, the only way COVID can hurt us is if it comes in from the outside. So that creates a mentality where you're thinking, well, we have our bubble. We might expand it for New Zealand, maybe a few Pacific countries which haven't had COVID. Great. But all the other people, well, they're sort of scary and they're disease vectors. And, and you know, this is what human histories look like. This is how we've often felt about, about plagues and about outsiders. Um, and so it's going to be so important to be finding every way we can to have those connections. Um, for right now, that is probably going to be digital. It's going to be trying to, to keep things going. So if you're talking about something like the Australia ASEAN um, Youth uh, Strategic Partnership, yes, you're going to want to do that digitally for as long as you can. But I think once it is possible to do, you know, to have travel, we've got to keep pushing it. You know, even if it's, even if you do have a two week quarantine, I'm going to be trying to bring international visitors in and say, yeah, see Australia for two weeks. We're COVID free. You'll have a great time. You know, I think we can use some sort of selling points and keep us connected, keep those, those people to people contacts. Um, I don't know what specifically will happen with things like the new Colombo plan. Um, 
I, I know obviously it hasn't been possible to continue at the moment. I hope it comes back soon because it has wonderful, wonderful um, stats. If you look at the 60,000 young people who've now been involved in the New Colombo plan, you know what that does for our connections internationally and for our soft power and the way we viewed, we want to keep that. So I hope as soon as it can come back, it does. We've just got a question again, good feedback. Um, I don't know if you're seeing these too, but how, how would you position the risks you've talked about on an urgency stroke priority matrix? I know that COVID is, is front of mind at the moment, but it picks up a question of someone else. You know, what, what are the unknown unknowns that we should be making you possibly less optimistic? Yeah, um, look, I, I wouldn't dare to try to say which of the four things I identified is more important or urgent. They're all important and urgent. And um, depending upon where you personally are and where you personally work, I think work on the one that, you know, you can have an impact on. That's how I would put it. Um, yes, there are other risks out there. And I, I didn't talk about some that, you know, I know are out there and I know are bad ones like, you know, Something like antibiotic resistance is a good example. Um, it's not going to bring human civilization to an end, but it's going to make life a hell of a lot more less comfortable <laughs> for a lot of people and a lot more difficult. So, you know, when you see issues like that, you see a problem coming, you want to be one of the voices saying, here's our problem and here's a compelling narrative that leads us towards a solution. You know, here's how we're going to solve and overcome this problem. Um, yeah, so it was not an exhaustive list. Absolutely not. Well, one from one from Patrick often. Why why is it in these times of threat do our leaders get a higher popularity rate? I'm sure Patrick knows that one too. Yeah, it, it's it's as simple as you know um, people are scared. They like strong leadership at this moment. Um, they want to pull together. Those are all really important things. I don't think we should discount them. Um, we should also hold our leaders accountable for making good decisions. So um, I think you can do both. You can be patriotic and work well together and have a community spirit and still, you know, still have reasoned discussions about what our leaders do. But then that neatly leads us on to the question most voted, and we've avoided any discussion of <laughs> President Donald J. Until now, but your thoughts on the US threat, well, the, the, the withdrawal of funding to the World Health Organization yeah, I think it's very unfortunate um, and counterproductive. Um, I understand it's part of the geopolitics, but from the perspective of what the World Health Organization does with that money, they use it for vulnerable countries to help them, and that's absolutely needed. So, I mean, it's notable that Australia was very clear that it was not going to follow that from the US because the work, what the work that the WHO does in the Pacific and Southeast Asia is just too valuable, and we do not wish to cut that at all. Um, I mean, what I would like to see come out of this crisis would be for countries to give up a bit more sovereignty and to put a bit more teeth in the WHO. But countries have to decide to do that. Australia can play a really important and useful middle power role in pushing for that. Um, if we, and, and this is the important part, if we're seen as an honest broker, as trying to improve the international system for the benefit of everybody, that would be a really helpful thing for us to do. But the difficulty, of course, is we can't be seen as doing it at the behest of any power or as against any power. It has to be about trying to make the systems better for everybody. Um, the, the idea that, that, that people are great at innovating when they see the opportunity. I mean, your, your view that we should leave that to, to the market or should there be more focus on governments encouraging investment in, in, in carbon to pursue mm. these opportunities? No, I see that question from Kate. Thank you. I, honestly, I think it's both. Um, I, I mean, government obviously has a role in setting the environment. So if you want a market to function properly, government often has to be involved in that. Um, and of course, government is very much involved in energy markets. So if you're talking about the subsidies that are already there, from government or the way that government organises energy markets. If you want to essentially level the playing field for renewables, that has to be a conscious choice from government. It can't just happen all by itself. So I think it's both, um, it's both government's thinking about its regulatory environment and what it creates, 
giving incentives for innovation and then individual companies and entrepreneurs saying wow this is great this is a great opportunity i will take up this and you know from my side um i just think there's so much room for for human ingenuity and innovation i am um, uh one of the one of the most optimistic movies I've seen recently, and I probably should have put on here, but I was putting you the, giving you the disaster movies rather than the, the positive ones. Um, it's, it's a movie by an Australian filmmaker, which takes the technologies that we have right now and imagines how they could transform the world. Um, and I am really gonna struggle to remember what year it is. It's a year, yeah? Like 2030, 2040, 2050, something like that, a year. Maybe it's 2035. It's when his daughter is going to be a particular age. And he tries to imagine the world that she's gonna see when she's that age. He takes technologies that exist right now and looks at how transformative they would be if they were put in place. Now, I watched it because my daughter's school choir was on the soundtrack, but gosh, it gave me such hope for the future. Back, back to international institutions. This is interesting. How can we rely on international institutions when so many states refuse to comply or cut funding or more international? My question there too is, where is the UN Security Council at the moment? Yeah, on some of these issues? Yeah, look, the UN Security Council can get involved, but I think you've got to expect, you know, it has it is going to be less effective during times of great power rivalry because that's what it is. It's the great powers forum where they can put a break on things if they don't want them to happen. Yes. So, you know, if, if um, it, on some issues you would expect pretty much no consensus to form from the security council. And that's just how it is. Um, but yeah, look, I think, I mean, that, that the question of sort of, what international organisations are allowed to do when their member states want to play politics or want to shift blame or all the rest. Yep, that's that's true. And that's been with us forever. Um, you know, it's, it's very, very rare for a national leader to say, gosh, yes, I stuffed up. I should have done things differently. Much, much more likely for them to say it's somebody else's fault. And, you know, that's, that's how it is. Um, but... Uh, you know, I, I think international organisations keep working and keep doing a good job, even in difficult political environments, and have since they were started. Um, and, and one thing I would say, and very important, is not to think that where we are right now is unprecedented. You know, so many of these problems, as I was showing you, have existed for a long time, and attempts at international organisation and international coordination have existed for a long time. You know, people in the past worked in really hard environments during the Cold War, you know, height of nuclear issues. You know, it's not that we live in such unprecedented times that no one's experienced it before. And that means we can learn from the past. We can say, okay, what worked well? You know, how did international organisations get through debt? through deadlocks during the peak of the Cold War. What can we take from that which will help us today? Um, rather than thinking it's just all impossible, saying, well, yeah, this is, this is things we've done before. We can do them again. We can learn from the past. So some helpful people say it's 2040 that it's called. Thank you, everybody. It was an excellent movie. I enjoyed it very much. Corresponding book to help people actually live for the future. Yep. Damon Garno. Yep. Name I excellent. Yep. And the soundtrack is very good. The, including the choir. Mm. What, <laughs> this is Carol. What will the Elizabeth? Economic, sorry, what will the economic impact from COVID have on international relations organisations? That's a big one for us. <laughs> yeah. Um, sort of in general. I mean, the whole economy is going to be hit here. It's going to be hit everywhere. Um, the modelling which says that this is the start of you know, the, the Great Depression. You've got to take that seriously. Um, I hope that that's it's not as bad as all of that, but I've got to take seriously that that might be what we're living through. In which case you then say, okay, let's pivot to that optimism. So it won't last forever. What can we do about it? You know, where are the opportunities? And uh, some organisations, if I may say, something like the Australian Institute of International Affairs Victoria, has pivoted very quickly, used this to find a much greater national audience than it previously would have. So, you know, in everything there is an opportunity and the trick is to find it, is to switch the thinking to see where that is. I'm just going to... We've had a, have a couple of questions about switching to nuclear for cleaner power and 
I mean, do, do you think, I mean, France is using it. Uh, so it do, do you think more countries might follow France and moving to nuclear power when it's safe to do so? Is that, is that an answer to be more optimistic about the future or going to yeah. lead to one of your nightmare scenarios? Yeah, no, and thank you. I saw that was a question from Zara. Thank you. Um, look, I, I have to say, I'm one of the people I'm not sold on, on nuclear power. Um, and it's a, it's a tricky one because if, if it, you know, if it stacked up, it would be a great um, way of generating energy in climate-friendly ways. But what I've seen of the modelling and the numbers and the economics and the science suggests to me it just doesn't stack up. That, you know, if you put it all together, the cost, um, the, you know, the carbon footprint of building a nuclear plant and decommissioning it, um, and of course, you've got the long-term storage of waste, the potential for, um, for accidents. Um, you put all of that together and it, it doesn't seem to me as economic. Um, I'm, you know, I'm open to it if the numbers stack up, but I haven't seen them stack up yet. So from, from my perspective, um, I think with the movie 2040, thank you everybody who told me it, um, it may be that it's not one big technology, it's lots and lots of technologies. And I find that interesting in itself, that we're sort of trained to think that there's one silver bullet, but there might not be. It might be taking up dozens and dozens of different technologies, all of which assist, all of which get taken up in different places at different times. Um, you're, you're, are you scanning through these uh, as well, Melissa? I, I am. Okay, I mean, if, if there's anyone you, you wanna grab, feel free, as <laughs> so we're, we're working our way through sort of eye on the clock to we finish in a timely way but if there's anything you see grab or well, i'll jump back in yeah so i i might go for the one on uh, from uh, Yicheng on internet intergovernmental transparency so uh, the concern about the lack of transparency from china um i, I was reading this week uh wonderful piece by um, Orhan Pamuk, the, the Turkish Nobel laureate, um, who's just written a book on plagues, you know, sort of in history. He's particularly focusing on one that hit the Ottoman Empire at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and he said that just in every plague, everywhere, the first instinct is to cover it up. That's, that's what authorities do and that's what authorities have done absolutely everywhere. Um, and... I think expecting a huge change in that area may not be realistic. And, and I'm not even certain it should be the main focus. Um, I think the systems we have at the moment uh, with countries required to share information with WHO, I think they should be beefed up and improved. I suspect there will always be a lag between what, say, provincial health authorities are saying and what national governments understand is happening. Like that's that's just one of the things that happens in health systems. Um, but anything we can do to improve the system, absolutely. Um, yeah, I I think it's interesting. I think transparency is probably not the word I'd be using so much because I think it has it's going to be perceived as having an element of blame in it. Um, what I would ideally like is all countries to say it's in everybody's interest to have uh, a stronger WHO. And the way we do that is we give the WHO investigative powers and we all subject ourselves to them. That'd be fantastic. That'd be a great result. And I think the way you get there is by putting it in everybody's interest to do so. So you probably talk more about early warning or about information sharing or something that doesn't sound threatening to countries, but makes them feel that it's something that they can agree to. We're getting, I suppose, towards the end, but I suppose there's always, there's always something good to learn or there's much to learn out of a crisis. I mean, how, do, you think, do you think we're going to find um, a better way of, of cooperating? We're going to see a, a good side of human nature coming out of this current uh, scenario hmm. yeah i don't know and, and that's where that's where the choice of optimism comes in doesn't it that um international crises can absolutely go both ways you know they can be the great spur to great international cooperation we can learn from them we can do things better or we cannot you know and, and you can see examples of both in in human history so i suppose i would be then switching that question to say well 
how do we how do we use this opportunity? If we're people who believe in international cooperation, you know, what do we do to try to to try to promote more of it? Um, and again, that's that's thinking about where you are. You know, if you're a commentator, a teacher, a citizen, um, you know, what can you do to to send that message? Um, if you've got people in your life who are certain that this means we should never interact with anyone in the rest of the world, if you have a conversation with them, I mean, you've got choices about how you try to use this as an opportunity for openness. Yeah, well, I think, it, you know, always on these talks, is a sign of a, a great talk when you have lots of questions still to get through. I mean, unless there's anything you particularly want to come up, I was starting just to wrap up with looking back at the polls. The first one we asked is, are you feeling optimistic at the moment? I mean, 47% were, were yes and 17% were no, and not yet with 36%. But then as we went through your talk and we got through and you said, you know, could you choose to be optimistic? Then the yes were up to 77%, no data, right. 6%, and okay, there's a few don't knows, but there's been a, 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 a marked increase in optimism over the last hour, the people watching. Oh. So, That's think, you know, wonderful to hear. That's I and yeah. and we, we've had we've had a, a great turnout. Um, had over 130, 140 people uh, tuned in from who knows all all around the world. But um, it, it's one of our tasks that we have to finish in a, a timely way. So I think we should probably start to, to wrap up. Unless there's anything you'd specific like to say, Elizabeth. That's, um, that's from our side, you. thank you very much for your time. Well done. Correct. Congratulations on your fellows award, which we will find a way of handing over in Perth <laughs> before too long. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much. Um, thank, thank you, Ben. I'm looking forward to the next webinar as a, an audience member. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for taking part. Um, I'm just going to meet you. Um, to everybody watching from home, wherever you are, thank you for your interest. Thanks for navigating your way through to join us. Uh, please, everybody, stay safe. Uh, keep an eye on our website. And we'll see you again soon, hopefully, for more webinars. And hopefully not too long before we actually get back together in person and enjoy each other's company. But until then, stay safe and thank you very much.